as a developer caching is a technique you can cache down to level up your website performance given the fact the minimum benchmark for a good modern day user experience on the web is quite high we've been able to keep up with this demand thanks to the innovative libraries and frameworks improving the experience of both the developer and the user really focusing on the code performance giving us that perfect light of score but a light of score mainly focuses on the first time load experience of a website what happens when the user revisits a site should they have to wait all over again and how does the first and second time differ well our app runs smoothly once it's loaded by the user's browser but first we need to get the files the browser sends a request to a server and download all the files needed to show your site your html css javascript images etc it depends on the network speed and consumes bandwidth especially if you're on mobile eating away into your mobile data now for the second time well we haven't added any new features to our site or any changes it's all the same files so browser can cache these files that don't change frequently on the site and this allows them to serve this faster for future requests saving numerous network calls and internet bills and on a high level that's all there is to it and this can make a huge difference but the reality as the saying goes two most difficult problems in computer science is cache invalidation and naming things Despite this, caching should be in the toolbox of every developer, especially if you are a front-end developer. In this video, we'll try to understand the main types of browser caches available to us on Chrome browser and break down exactly how browser determines where to get the resource when it's requested. In the upcoming video, we'll look at how to better control our cache using the cache control header and some common practices follows. With the advantages now clear, let's step back and look at the big picture. Browser cache is just one type of cache, one piece of the bigger puzzle. There are other types of caches as well, such as server-side caches, content delivery network caches, shared caches, which also play a significant role in boosting web performance. The CDNs or shared caches are storage spaces that can be accessed by multiple users or processes. It helps us to make data access faster for a global audience. These are typically stored on a network server, making them accessible to various parts of the same application, multiple applications. This might be data that are requested by multiple users in a region including files, database queries, or even computational results. Together, both browser cache and shared cache work together to make browsing more efficient, reduce load times, decrease network traffic, and provide a better experience. To see browser caches in action, I'm on Chrome with my Twitter profile open and the developer tools on the right on the networks tab. Now, to simulate first time loading, let me empty cache and hard reload to make all the requests from the network and fetch all the resources. And you can see it kind of loads in like 2.3 seconds and all the resources are fetched from network. Now, let me try refresh it again and this time you can see it loads faster it loads in 1.75 seconds and you can see most of the content here are taken from the cache now if i refresh it again and on subsequent refreshes you can see that it kind of starts taking the content from cache especially the images and you can see most of the images like the logo of twitter and all this that doesn't change often are cached in our disk cache which we'll be getting into so this you can see does make a significant difference in website performance now google chrome has four different types of caches first First, we have the memory cache. This is a short term cache where we can store stuff for the current document's lifespan, that is until you close the tab. It's non persistent and it's stored in memory. Then we have the disk cache. This is a persistent disk based cache where you can store stuff even after the current document's lifespan. Then we have the service worker cache, and unlike other caches, this is the only one that has an API that we can manipulate and control. And it's persistent, just like this cache. Now they've implemented caching pretty well on Twitter. Now I've closed our previous tab and reopened it, and you can see most of the content here has been loaded from the disk cache, which is persistent. Now let me refresh the page. You can see some of the content has been moved to the memory cache, which is faster. Now modern browsers are clever enough to figure out when to move this stuff between the caches and it's given out of the box for us. And all we have to do is ensure we follow good caching practices, set our cache control headers right and that's about it. You can also see that Twitter makes use of the service worker cache as well, indicating that this is a progressive web app that you can actually use just like you would use a normal mobile app. Service worker are the building blocks of progressive web apps, what gives us the ability to provide offline support and stuff like that, so it's pretty exciting. Then we have the push cache. This is where resources push through the HTTP to are stored, and it's a way in which server can push an update to the client, and uh, it's something that's beyond the scope of this video. Finally, we have stuff like backcode forward cache that helps us to cache pages based on routes and stuff, but generally, these are the main caches available on the browser. Now let's break down exactly how the browser determines where to get a file or a resource when it's required. First, it looks in the service worker cache. If the file is available, then it can decide to return the cache resource depending on the caching strategies followed. But keep in mind this doesn't happen.
happen automatically. You need to set up a fetch event handler in your service worker and reroute the network request to serve them from the service worker cache instead of the network. Now, if the resource isn't found in your service worker cache, next up is the HTTP cache, also known as the browser cache, your disk or memory cache we discussed earlier. And modern browsers can figure out what's the best way to serve it. But if the resource is found here and it hasn't expired, the browser will automatically use the cache resource, saving time and resources. Now, if the resource isn't found on either the service worker cache or the HTTP cache, then it has to go to the network to fetch the resource. This can be directly to your shared cache or your content delivery network. And if it's not found there, then it has to travel all the way back to the origin server. So that's the journey the browser takes when it needs a resource from service worker cache to HTTP cache to the network to the shared cache to the final server site. And it's all about finding the best way to deliver the resource to provide the best user experience possible. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And in the next video, we'll look at how to better control our cache using the cache control header, which is the biggest player when it comes to caching on the web. And with that, we have come to end of the part one. Do let me know your feedbacks, like, share and subscribe. And yeah, thanks for watching.